Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I remember the story of the priest who was nervous. After witnessing his anxiety, the elder priest in the parish gave him advice. Have a drinking glass by your side and take a sip. Put a little vodka in the water to calm your nerves. <laughs> so the priest did exactly that. After his sermon, when he asked the rector how he did, the rector said, pretty good with a few tiny errors. Sip the vodka, don't gulp it down. <laughs> there are 10 commandments, not 12. <laughs> there are 12 disciples, not 10. <laughs> Jesus was consecrated, not constipated. For your benefit, there's no drinking glass up here, so we're all good. <laughs> good morning, church. Good morning. It's always a good morning when we can come together and be in fellowship with one another and praise God. And it's especially a good morning, even though I'm nervous, being here with you, the good people of all saints. I want to thank Susan for this invitation. I want to have to say great it is to worship with Lynn Jay. We were seminary classmates at Bloy House all those years ago, and I remember worshiping with her when she was rector of St. Andrews and St. Charles, so thank you, I'm glad to be here. I'm also happy to be here in California. California is what I call my happy place. It's where I became an adult without my parents knowing everything I was doing and having something to say about it. I moved to California when I was 32. My kids were in tow, my husband a writer. It was the total opposite of everything Chicago, and I adored it from the minute I got off the plane and it was 82 degrees. <laughs> For me, a daughter of the south side of Chicago, Southern California was freedom. Two decades before I was born, a boy named Eugene Williams drowned because he went on the wrong side of Lake Michigan Beach. He was 17 years old, wanting a relief from on a hot summer day. But the white beach on 29th Street was forbidden. Stones were thrown at him, and he fell off his raft. The man who stoned him wasn't arrested, which began a riot when word spread. The riot lasted eight days. It is known as Red Chicago. And not much has changed in my lifetime. The assertion and reassertion of racial dominance racial dominance. So Los Angeles was like breathing flesh, fresh air. I didn't have to monitor where I went or who I talked to. I could be free. In those early years of being an Angelina, Pasadena was a ritual of mine every New Year's Day. The director of St. John's Church, which is now the cathedral here in the diocese, was my home parish. The rector then, Bill Purcell, who later became Bishop of Chicago, lived in Pasadena with his wife and six children, and they had an open house every January 1st. We would drive from LA down to 110 to Pasadena, avoiding the closed off streets because of the preparation for the Rose Bowl, and was welcomed into a place that felt like home with like-minded faith folk, eating and chatting and talking about football. It was a hopeful start to the year that I depended on. So this place being here fills me with all kind of memories. Thank you again, Susan, for the invite. All Saints Pasadena has a deep history as a spiritual community of engagement, racial compassion, justice, and collaboration. 
I'm honored to be here on this fifth Sunday of Lent, this Women in History Sunday. One of the things I've noticed over the past decade of social media expression, outrage, photograph sharing, recipe sharing, and applause is that women are frequently admonished when we don't speak our truth. We are supposed to be authentic despite the consequence as if it is easy, something that we don't have to think about. Be true to ourselves and our convictions in the face of power. Don't stumble. Easier said than done. In Exodus, the story is told of the midwives' dilemma. Their job was to bring life into the world, to continue God's miracle. But they were ordered by the king of Egypt to kill the boy babies. It couldn't have been easy for them to renege. He was the king. He was the pharaoh. When he gave his orders, he expected instant obedience. What takes practice, what takes contemplation, what takes commitment is the unshakable covenant with God, fearing God, loving God, obeying God, both individually and collectively, even while disobeying the powerful. Disobedience is from obedience, but it is love. It's been 50 years since 11 women loved God but disobeyed the church. 11 women convinced a black priest, Paul Washington, to host an ordination at Church of the Advocate in Philadelphia with three bishops. July 1974, and the press got a hold of this, quote, secret thing going on. It wasn't whimsical or random. Women had gone through the traditional channels of the church, but had been rejected each time. The last rejection was 57 votes in the House of Deputies. And so they asked these bishops and Paul Washington to be their ally. Over a thousand people attended. The ordination, however, was ruled invalid, and the bishops who ordained the 11 were disobedient as were the women priests. They did not love the church, they couldn't. They had disobeyed, but what <laughs> was not their story? 36 years ago, in 1988, I was a young priest invited to attend the Lambeth Congress conference in England and address a group of men. The Lambeth Conference met every 10 years with all the Anglican bishops from around the world in attendance at the invitation of the Archbishop of Canterbury. They had never been addressed to by an ordained woman. I was the first. I was nervous. I was nervous, but I was also raised in the city with restrictions. Everything I wasn't allowed to do was drilled in my head. In seminary, I dealt with men who had no idea what to do with me, so their anger didn't frighten me. And during my address, I spoke about women, ordained women's voices and presence. I felt empowered and redeemed because of the Philadelphia 11 and those I had known. I did receive a standing ovation at the end of my address, led, led by the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The Philadelphia 11 were forbidden to perform the sacraments after their ordination. The church continued to deny to them the right to celebrate and deliver the sacrament for the next two years. Although there were congregations throughout the country who did invite them to celebrate, and Katrina Swenson, one of the 11, did come and celebrate at St. John's in LA. The newly ordained priest, though, did celebrate a Eucharist at Riverside Church, which is not an Episcopal church in New York City. 
And it was after that that several Episcopal churches began to invite them to celebrate. And the 76th General Convention voted to allow women's ordination. And even though the ordination of the Philadelphia 11 was regularized, they had a hard time finding jobs. And five of the 11 were gay. They were named, but they were not loved. Still, they knew how to sister folk, how to mother folk, how to extend compassion, how to listen and advocate, how to fight for justice, how to be faithful. They knew how to be priests, and they loved Jesus, and Jesus loved them. Thinking of it now reminds me of that early 20th century British novelist and essayist, Virginia Woolf. One of her most famous books is called A Room of One's Own. She writes about the importance of women to have a space of their own in order to be creative. She describes going into the library at Oxford. Women were banned, but she finally got permission to go in. She decided to look at all the books about women. She piled them up. They were all written by men. <laughs> she was reading them and trying to take notes. And the next booth was a chemistry student, and he had his textbooks. And he had a very neat notebook with perfectly outlined formulas and codes and everything he needed. She wasn't so much critical of what he was doing, but thought, why is it that we have so many contradictory ideas, and they're all written by men. Where are the women's voices? It's always been an act of disobedience to say that out loud, to have wanted a room of their own within the church, to ask for our needs to be met. We are disobeying tradition, is what we are told when we are loving God and loving ourselves and expecting more. When we demand access and equal treatment, when we expect our voices to be included in our history honored. I'd like, in January of 1984, I was invited to attend the 40th anniversary of the first woman ordained priest at a service at Westminster Abbey in London. I thought the Philadelphia 11 were the first. Little did I know that Florence Lee Timoy had been ordained in Hong Kong. She was working with refugees in Macau, and no priests were available, so a bishop ordained her. After the war, however, she did not function as a priest until 1971, when two other women were ordained as priests in Hong Kong. We then reconnected in 1989 when Barbara Harris was consecrated, and she and I were concelebrants with Bishop Harris at her consecration. And I thought the Philadelphia 11 were the first ordained women, and here I had met Lee T. Moy, who was ordained in 1944. While Polly Murray was not always supportive of the ordinations in 1974, she was supportive of them afterwards. Being a founder of NOW, the National Organization of Women, she was a staunch supporter of women's rights. As a lawyer, she wanted to change the laws, not necessarily break them. We met when she came up to General Seminary to meet with the students there. She was the first African-American woman ordained priest in this church. She told me how she admired the efforts of the Philadelphia 11 and was glad they were now accepted as priests. She said her legal background affected her actions and she may have been wrong. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, she states in no uncertain terms, in Christ, there is no male, no female, no slave, nor free, no Jew, nor Gentile, Gentile, for we all children of God and are all loved by God. I have never heard a bishop, priest, or layperson try to explain their opposition to the ordination of women 
using Paul's writing in Galatians. <laughs> I wonder why. How did they explain their position when scripture is clear? We are all made in the image of God. Love is a noun, a thing, but love can be a verb, action. You are loving something. You are loving yourself. You are loving others. Love is a practice. Disobedience is a noun, a thing, but disobedience can be a verb. 15 years after the Philadelphia 11 forced their own ordination, Barbara Harris was consecrated a bishop the first woman, the first black woman to be so honored. Barbara had come full circle. She was the crucifer at the 11, when the 11 women were ordained at the Church of the Advocate in 1974. She had carried the cross during the procession and in 1989 was consecrated in front of 8,000 people. And Barbara Harris was also the preacher at my ordination. In 1985. Barbara wasn't a patient person and was often disobedient. She became frustrated at the pace of equality in the church. Just because women ordained didn't mean that the church doors swung wide open. Despite the Philadelphia 11 historic presence, women still had to squeeze through. Loving God and being disobedient to tradition doesn't mean times move the way we want it to. Barbara Harris emulated what I have always known. Disobedience is the same kind of action as love. Disobedience is a choice. It is repetitive and rooted in kindness. Love is a choice. It is repetitive and rooted in kindness. When When the midwives refused to kill the baby boys, Pharaoh gathered them together the way powerful men like to do to imitate those they could not manipulate. He asked them why. He gave an order and they refused. Why did they disobey him? We all know how this goes. Your boss calls you into the office and you figure out what to say to keep your job and to keep his rage to a minimum. The midwife, who was a spokesman for the group, told the king that Egyptian women were stronger than Hebrew women, and that by the time they arrived for the delivery, the babies were already born. There was nothing left to do. He bought it. They were spared his wrath, but more importantly, it pleased God. The love of God fueled their disobedience. The disobedience did not trigger their covenant with God. In turn, God rewarded the midwives with fertility and grace. Disobedience depends on obedience. Soon, we will come to the table to receive that which we already are, the body and blood of Christ. For we are the bread that is broken into the world, a world hungry for the knowledge of God. We are the wine poured out into the world, a world thirsty for the love of God. We don't have to go out to love and serve God, but we do it in thanksgiving for all that has, God has given to us. We're the crown, the writer Toni Morrison once said, it's been paid for by someone's sacrifice by someone's hardship, by someone sitting in the back of the bus and then not sitting in the back of the bus, by someone saying, ain't I a woman? By someone's brilliance, by someone's murder on the cross, 
by someone's disobedience and by God's love. Wear the crown. I say to you this beautiful Sunday morning of women's history, wear the crown. It's been paid for. Amen. <laughs>